statement about millennials. They're the most highly educated um, demographic in, our, in this country's history. So 49% of people under the age of 40 have a university degree or above in Sydney and Melbourne. And we, we also know that if you've got a tertiary qualification, you're less likely to vote conservative. So there's all these, I would say, undercurrents that are just flowing in one direction. And yes, they can go and call, um, side with the nationals, but they're just not going to have enough seats to win. If they, mm. keep, if, if they follow this pathway, uh, they're going to run out of demographic runway. One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer, be scared. The the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Emily Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today we're going to dig into the historic Aston by-election result. On Saturday, the 1st of April 2023, history was made. Labor's Mary Doyle won over Liberal candidate Rashina Campbell 54 to 46%. It's the first time in more than 120 years a government had won a by election from an opposition. I guess I'll be your next member for Aston, eh? On these numbers, Labor has made history and will win the Aston by-election. The first government in 100 years to take a seat from the opposition in a by-election. In uncertain times, the people of Aston have put their faith in our government and I thank them so sincerely. The Liberal Party is once again in damage control this morning after losing last night's by-election in the federal seat of Aston in Victoria. Tonight was not our night. But our democracy needs a strong opposition. This is historically safe Liberal territory. So losing this seat is a big deal for your political party. Put it in context for us, how bad is it for the Liberal Party to lose the seat of Aston tonight? Yeah, it's cataclysmically bad. And it is electoral catastrophe. Um, Victoria is a busted flush in terms of party governance and organisation. And that tells you there's something very rotten in the borough here. Coming on the heels of the Liberals losing government at the New South Wales election, as well as losing a number of seats to Labor, Teals and the Greens at the federal election, the by-election result has many people asking what the electoral future holds for the Liberal Party. So today to unpack those results, I'm talking to political analyst Cos Samaras, director at Redbridge Group Australia and Labor's former Victorian Deputy Campaign Director. You may have seen him on the ABC's coverage on election night. G'day Cos, thanks for joining us. G'day. So, Cos, this, as we said, is quite an historic result. What were the results on Saturday? What what exactly happened? Basically, a continuation of, I would say, the electoral undercurrent that is sweeping through the country in our big cities, big capital cities, and that is they are causing uh, more and more uh, problems for the coalition. And what I mean by that they're down to 14 seats in urban in urban areas within our capital cities out of 79. So they've basically now become, that is the Liberal Party, a, 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 a party that effectively wins electorates whenever there is a r- regional or rural component inserted into an urban electorate, mm-hmm. like a La Trobe in Melbourne, for example, or Casey, um, or Canning in WA. Uh, but any electorate that is completely urban uh, they hold uh, with wafer thin margins, and there's 14 of them left. Yeah, so just give us those numbers again, because that's quite shocking. So, out of how many urban electorates do the Liberals now hold seats? 14. 14, 14. across the country. That's right. So, one in Perth, and again, not that doesn't include Canning, because Canning's got a very significant rural regional component to it. Um, but one in Adelaide, uh, three in Melbourne, three in Brisbane and six in Sydney, none, of course, in Hobart. Um, Yeah. So that's effectively the sum of their existence in our large capital cities, and that is a a massive existential crisis they're facing. 
Coalition's historic loss of the seat of Aston. It's the first time in more than a century that a government has won a seat off an opposition at a by-election and just the second time in the nation's history. The government's historic win in the Victorian seat of Aston leaves the Liberal Party with only two federal seats in metropolitan Melbourne. And we talked about the result being historic, partly because it's very difficult for governments to win by-elections. Can you just put that result in context for us as well? Mm, yeah, that's right. Since 19, I think the last time this happened was in 19, uh, 1920. But I think it also sh- it shocked a number of, I would say, political observers because uh, the narrative that was built after the federal election last year was a lot of the swings we saw against the coalition were largely because of Morrison. And everything's going to, you know, right itself now and everything's fine. And really it was about Morrison. It wasn't about some of the points we've been making, which is, well, actually, it's a generational problem they're now facing, millennials and Generation Z in particular, but also there's, uh, um, they've got problems with two of the uh, uh, rap, most rapidly emerging uh, diverse communities in the country. They've got problems with some of the fastest growing occupations in the country. Um, and they are the real undercurrents that are driving these results and and I would say Morrison was simply just one of many uh, Liberal Party MPs in in his case Prime Minister who uh, are going to struggle in uh, in trying to secure these votes. Yeah well because historically as we've been talking about uh, by-elections are an opportunity for normally for voters to send a message to the government but in this case they've sent quite a stark one uh, to the opposition I mean, it seemed to shock a lot of pundits on the night. Uh, It certainly didn't seem like the Liberal Party was expecting it. Uh, What were you thinking in the lead up to this by-election? Yeah, so whenever I was asked for comment on it, my my narrative was always, okay, so we know that at the last election, Albanese was an unknown entity within the electorate, largely speaking. Uh, We know that his stocks are now much higher. We know that the Labor primary federally at the May federal election last year was much lower than it is now when we base it on what the news poll is telling us. So all the um, benchmarks out there were suggesting that history may not repeat itself. That said, the margin was 2.75 and also Aston has a suburb called Scroville in it, which is effectively from a demographic perspective, you would to define a suburb in Melbourne that should be Liberal Party heartland, it's Roville. And so I thought, well, maybe um, that will prevent the opposition from losing the seat. Um, it didn't transpire. So it does appear that Yes, the Albanese factor was at play, um, but also I would say the the um, continuation of this demographic tidal wave, which is buffeting the Liberal Party right now, is is um, is definitely at play. So I do want to dig into that demographic tidal wave a little bit, but mm. also some of the the issues that you think were in play in this election and how they compared to the issues that the Liberal Party was running on. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, the Liberal Party ran this campaign on the ground um, trying to uh, incentivise voters to punish the government for the cost of living crisis, which people were dealing with. Uh, They obviously had an assumption that people will punish the incumbent for uh, what is going on economically right now. When we speak to voters all around the country, their response is, well, you know, I don't really think uh, uh, our political uh, representatives are... Um, have the capacity to deal with this and fix it, Uh, that what I'm experiencing in my own household, in my workplace, is really a manifestation of a lot of things. And so, you know, you've got got a fairly educated, switched on electorate. They know know why things are happening. Um, The flip side to that was that if you were, uh, if you're one of the many thousands of voters in Aston who really don't pay much attention to politics, uh, probably were not aware of the by-election until probably a week to go, maybe even a day or two even. Um, and the only thing you would have noticed about, around politics would be the more redeeming issue, uh, you know, all that sort of culture war, fringe stuff that's coming from the, from, the, from the conservative side of politics playing itself out in a very big way. Mm. And, and um, you know, for most voters, they just find that, that stuff quite weird and odd. And yeah. 
doesn't well, speak to them. Yeah, if I can ask you about that, because obviously you come uh, from a Labor background, yeah. but your colleague Tony Barry, who's yes. from the Liberal side of politics, I think on the night, um, or it might have been you, talked about that when the Liberal Party is playing on the political fringes, you get fringe results or, so, or something yeah, like right. that. The Victorian Liberal Party has been playing on the fringes for a long time, mm. and we saw that in the last couple of weeks. And if you play on the fringes, you start getting fringe results. Mm. And three seats out of 26 is a fringe party result. But, but how about if a seat like So does his analysis differ anything from, from yours? What does he diagnose as the problem? Absolutely. It's the same. We, 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 we share the same uh, perspective on this, and that is when we go and talk to voters and we actually tr uh, we ask them, okay, what is the top of mind issue? What is animating your, your views around the, uh, about, about the world around you, your workplace, your home? Uh, let's just say that trans issues never come up unless we prompt it. And when we prompt it, their response is, yeah, well, okay, um, look, if I've got kids at a school and there's an issue there, I'll go and discuss it with the, with the principal. I don't want some politician sticking their nose in this, you know, so they, they don't want the political class involved. Mm. That's um, one spectrum. And then yep. the other spectrum is there's empathy there too, right? So when we talk about millennials and Gen Z, their response is, oh, no, um, they're very big supporters of that, of that LGBTIQ community. And every time the coalition goes into that space, they they make their case, and that case being, do not vote for us, uh, over and over again. Yeah. The party is being told by its media backers to move further and further to the right and focus on value issues, whether it's, you know, transgender kids or, you know, whether it is denying climate change. You know, all of this craziness that has been infecting the party for years that I used to battle against, uh, and now that those chickens are coming home to roost and it is electoral catastrophe. Because the red hot button issues in Australian politics, climate change, women in politics, an anti-corruption commission, this, conf this bizarre obsession with bathrooms, they are not issues that dominate actually the Labor Liberal divide. They dominate, there's a divide inside the Liberal Party and that they fight about those things. It's not whether or not you think either any of those things are right or wrong. They're fighting about those things. Um, so I guess coming back to those demographic issues that you were talking about, so Liberals are clearly struggling even in their blue ribbon seats that you would expect them, you know, to win easily. What are some of those demographic trends? There's three major, major, uh, I would say, undercurrents that are causing them significant grief. The first one is that millennial Gen Z which I've spoken to, spoken about quite a lot through the media, but that's basically people under the, under, under the age of 40. We do know uh, that across the country, the coalition secures about one in five of these Australians. In some areas, that is much lower, uh, particularly as you come into Melbourne, and it doesn't matter where the under 40 year old cohort is, it's still one in five or lower. It could be in a place like Aston, for example. So. Labor at a state level in Victoria holds the state seat of Bayswater, for example, which is in Aston, and has now um, won it twice. It's, it's historically been a very blue seat. But what has happened there is over the last five, five, five or so years, probably 10 years, you've had a steady migration of millennials moving out to areas like Bayswater where they can afford a cheaper home to buy. Thing about Melbourne is it still allowed a lot of people to move around a lot, which is very different to Sydney. You could still buy a home in Bayswater three or four years ago for about seven hundred thousand to six hundred fifty thousand. Um, so that that's one dynamic. Um, we just quickly touch on Gen Z, which is actually quite worse for the coalition. So Gen Z are um, largely people from our eighteen to twenty four years old, and obviously you know as every year goes by, more and more of them are jumping on the roll. They are the worst constituency for the coalition. Uh, their support uh, amongst that, that that particular constituency is within the single digits. Right. You know, right? That's and they, you know, to give you some contrast, um, there's a, a study that was published recently where one in five of Gen Z identifies LGBTIQ plus. So that's a very progressive generation that's coming through, through the electoral roll right now. And that's uh, bad news for the coalition. Now, this constituency, yes, plays out differently in Queensland. That's a different dynamic entirely, particularly outside of Brisbane. Um, 
So the other dynamic, the other current, the second bit is the uh, Chinese and Indian Australian constituency. Um, so uh, particularly the Ch Australian, uh, Chinese Australians, they uh, historically have been fairly good supporters of the coalition. And I think their treatment by the Morrison government and the way the Morrison government, I would say, try to uh, aerate and elevate the issue uh, with regards to China really did severe damage to them. And we do know for a lot of the research that we've done, and we could see this through the electoral results, that the Chinese community has now completely departed uh, the coalition and now vote Labor or independence. Mm. Uh, we saw the consequences of that in the recent New South Wales election. Uh, we definitely saw the results of that in the federal election where seats like Benelong, uh, Reid, uh, Fowl, uh, and and of course seats like Kyuyong, which have got large Ch Chinese Australian community. The seat of Menzies now is an ultra marginal seat. Um, and Aston, of course, has uh, thousands upon thousands of Chinese Australians enrolled to vote. Um, so again, that's that other pillar. And of course, the final one is over the last 20 years, the fastest growing uh, workforce are largely women who work in public sector jobs, nurses, teachers, and so on. And they are again with this particular constituency, um, suffering the same levels of low levels of support. Mm. So, you know, we're dealing with around 20 to 30 percent. Um, and then we saw how that played out itself out in New South Wales with the recent state election where the seats which contain a lot of these types of workers swung the hardest against the coalition because they mm. also were combating that workforce with a wage cap. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, we did the Australian Institute did some research on uh, on wage caps and um, water privatisation um, seemed to be another big issue there. But those demographic trends are, are really interesting, and I guess this result uh, really interested me in particular, not just because of its historic nature, but also because. Um, you know, coming off the back of the New South Wales election and the federal election before that, uh, the Liberals appear to be losing seats to Labor, to the Teals, to the Greens. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, what's the future for the coalition? Is partly, are they going to have to deal with the Nationals kind of dragging them to the right on things like climate change uh, and how to cope with that? Um, appealing to that section of their um, voter base compared to how those messages turn off uh, people in in the cities, basically. Mm, There's a real big problem for them because as we spoke about at the beginning uh, of, of this podcast, um, most of the seats are situated in, in uh, our large capital cities. And Yes, okay, they do better in Queensland because 52% of Queensland's population lives outside of Brisbane. But then you come to, to a place like Victoria, for example, and 78% of Victoria's population is in Melbourne. Perth is very similar. Adelaide is very similar, and to a lesser extent, Sydney. So if you're, not, if you're not doing well in these big cities and you're not talking to uh, voters within these big cities, and to give you another you know, stat about millennials, they're the most highly educated um, demographic in, our, in this country's history. So 49% of people under the age of 40 have a university degree or above in Sydney and Melbourne. And we, we also know that if you've got a tertiary qualification, you're less likely to vote conservative. So there's all these, uh, these I would say, undercurrents uh, uh, just flowing in one direction and Yes, they can go and call, uh, uh, um, side with the Nationals, but they're just not going to have enough seats to win. If they, mm. if, if they follow this pathway, uh, they're going to run out of demographic runway. You have to think they'd have to think about dumping Peter Dutton. But... I would suspect that after the voice referendum, depending on what happens there, then we're probably into a killing season for the Liberals. As a party, you should stick with Peter Dutton and, in fact, lean in to, to him and Absolutely. go out and sell him, put him, put him all over Absolutely. the posters. And really... The idea of putting Peter Dutton on posters everywhere, Peter is on posters everywhere in Victoria, but they're Labor Party posters, and there's a reason for that. In your own words, this was a test of your leadership, so have you failed that test? Well, we, we didn't win the seat, so uh, by definition, uh, we have a lot of work to do. I accept responsibility, and I'm the leader of the party. I was there last night uh, to do that. I agreed to come on to the show. 
And what have you thought so far uh, about how Peter Dutton has responded to these results? Do you get the sense that he's put his finger on the pulse of these demographic trends coming their way or that he's, yeah, what's your sense of the Liberal Party's response to this by-election result? Yeah, look, I would say that this election of their candidate was the right step, right? They, for the first time, irrespective of some of the commentary around where she lived and so on, it was still the right candidate if you're trying to telegraph a message to the Australian public that you're going to you're going to change. However, um, but I think that's where it stops. Uh, he obviously is playing a very a very um, uh, difficult game of juggling the the various factions within his political party, particularly the hard right. And you could see that play itself out in the insider's interview on Sunday morning, where he was asked some questions around trans rights and he couldn't give you a straight answer. He then alluded to the to, to the possibility that there are thousands upon thousands of parents out there in the suburbs who are concerned about this issue, which is just not true. Mm. Um, and then, of course, they're now playing footsies with the uh, yes vote. Now, these are all things that if I was worried about some of these undercurrents that we've been talking about, I would not be taking those steps. Um, and so I just don't see Dutton has the the agility, the political agility within his own political organisation to actually remedy the problem because of the, all those constraints we just touched on. Yeah. Well, if you're asking me about the, the fundamentals of our party, uh, they're, they're not going to change. Uh, we have a proven track record when we're in government. So kind of casting your mind forward to the next election, um, what does the lay of the land look like for the various political parties? Yeah, so I think... Um, they will continue to do well in places like Queensland, particularly outside of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. Depending on how the economy fares, there's a possibility that you know Labor could be in could get itself into trouble with some of some of the mortgage belt electorates, which have a regional component to them. So, um, like a McEwen, you know those type of electorates, where or uh, anything that that sits on the on the peri urban um, um, sort of locale of our large cities is where I think uh, the coalition will may do well. But that's where it stops because unless something drastic happens, they're going to continue to suffer that attrition in, as you come further into the large um, population clusters of our, of our large capital cities. Um, I don't think they'll succeed in retaking those till seats. Uh, I think they'll struggle to contain um, their problems in large cities where they do still hold seats. So seats like Menzies and Deakin might be problematic for them. Uh, any other observations before we let you go? I think that's about it. I think the other dynamic, of course, is, yes, this is we're talking about Labor versus Liberal, but I think the Labor Party might, at, over time, also get itself into trouble with Greens as well. So I think that we should just keep an eye on those seats that mm. you might actually see a genuine three-way contest at the next election where, yes, Labor doesn't lose all that many seats to the coalition, but it loses um, a, a few more to the Greens. Mm. Well, interesting times to come, to say the least. Thanks very much no for your time, you. Cos. Cheers. This episode was recorded live on Tuesday the 4th of April 2023 and things may have changed since recording. If you liked today's episode, please rate and review us. It helps other people to find the show. And if you love the show and want to continue for us to do work with impact and influence, please consider supporting us with a small tax-deductible gift today at australiainstitute.org.au. That's also where you can find all our latest research and content and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Cos is at Cos Samaras. That's K-O-S-S-A-M-A-R-A-S. -S -S. Our producer, Jennifer Macy, is at Jennifer Macy. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening. Oh, oh, oh.